You're listening to Deconstructive Criticism. I am Aaron Flam. Richard Allen Landis is a passionate American historian and author with a unique focus on medieval millennial thinking. In this episode, we talk about Pallywood, a term Professor Landis has coined. But first, I want to thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism, and a special thanks to you who contribute on Patreon. If you wish to contribute to my work, you can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash Aaron Flam, patreon.com slash Aaron Flam in one word, or donate via PayPal with Bitcoin or on Swish 0046 768 943737. 0046 768 943737. Please help spread deconstructive criticism. All contributions matter. Pallywood is a term that has been used to describe a perceived phenomenon involving the manipulation of media and the staging of events by Palestinians, particularly in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The term is a portmanteau of Palestinian and Hollywood, thus Pallywood, suggesting that Palestinians are using media, including photographs and videos, to create propaganda or manipulate public perception of events in their favor. In this endeavor, they have plenty of help from Western media who gladly pay for their action-packed pictures. The West is all too ready to believe anything as long as it portrays the Jewish state as evil. Those who use the term Pallywood allege that Palestinians or individuals sympathetic to the Palestinian cause stage or exaggerate incidents, such as casualties or confrontations, for media attention and to generate sympathy for their cause. Their actions lead to a distorted or biased portrayal of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the media. Critics of the concept argue that it is often used to dismiss legitimate grievances and portray Palestinians as deceitful or manipulative. Proponents of the term claim that it highlights instances of media manipulation and the need for critical analysis of information coming from conflict zones. Israel has since 710 provided evidence that Palestinian journalists participated in the attack and helped spread video of the atrocities as a part of Hamas propaganda efforts. In general, discussions related to Palavid are highly politicized and opinions on the extent and significance of media manipulation in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict vary widely. So I thought it would be interesting to talk with a man who is credited with inventing the term, Pallywood. Richard Landers is an academic powerhouse. His early works delved into hagiography, the writing or study of the lives of saints or other holy individuals, especially in the context of religious traditions. Hagiographies are biographical accounts or narratives that focus on the virtues, miracles, and religious achievements of these revered figures. Landers have, among other things, translated the Vita of Saint Marshall and exploring the life of the scribe and forger Ademar de Chaban. For many years, Richard Landis was a distinguished professor in the Department of History at Boston University, where he also served as the director of Boston University's Center for Millennial Studies. In 2015, he embarked on a new adventure, becoming a senior fellow at the Center for International Communication at Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel. What truly sets Richard apart is his specialization in millennial thinking in the Middle Ages, particularly around the pivotal year 1000. In 2000, he made history himself by publishing what was considered the first encyclopedia on millennial movements in Europe, the Encyclopedia of Millennialism and Millennial Movements. Richard Landers is a scholar who is not afraid to challenge conventional wisdom and explore the fascinating realms of history, culture, and politics. I urge you to watch his short documentary, Pallywood, on Vimeo. You can find the link in the description of this episode on aaronflam.com. Here is Richard Lands. Enjoy. Welcome to Deconstructive Criticism. I am Aaron Flam. And you are Professor Richard Landers. Yes. Am I pronouncing that correctly? That's it, Landis. All right. Uh, I usually start my interviews by letting uh, uh, the interview uh, subject describe themselves and what they're uh, and who they are. So, uh, uh, in your own words, who are you? So um, I was trained as a medievalist. 
And uh, starting in 2000, when, according to the book I've just written, everything started going south, uh, I got involved in the way the media was covering the conflict between Israel and her neighbors. And since then, I have continued to work in both fields. Uh, It's uh, pretty depressing to see what's happening in the contemporary field. Um, I love my medieval history a whole lot more. Yes. Uh, Could you explain to my listeners what a medievalist does? Because you're an expert in millennial uh, cults from the medieval times. Okay, so the Middle Ages is generally considered the period from the fall or the non-fall of the Roman Empire around 500 to the start of the Renaissance, 1450, 1500. So generally from 500 to 1500 CE, AD, um, is the period that I study. And I focus in particular on the year 1000 or the turn of the first millennium. My latest book is about the turn of the second millennium. Um, because I discovered that, uh, first of all, there was an enormous amount of interest in trying to date the end, um, pretty much from the early, from the beginning of Christianity, but in terms of years or decades or centuries, starting in the first century, you first start to get these efforts to date the end, which are generally introduced by people who are saying, at least the ones that survive uh, in the documentation are the ones that are saying, well, we have to wait another two, three hundred years. So it's a way of saying, yes, the millennium, you know, peace on earth, uh, you won't have to be serfs to mean people. Um, Justice will come but we have to wait another two, three hundred years. And what happens is when you approach that year, um, the very people who were first promoting the dating system uh, switch to a dating system that's further away because, you know, the dating system they've introduced is now serving the very people it was supposed to keep quiet, namely the people saying it's now. And the year thousand is, a, I think, a huge wave of apocalyptic expectation at all levels of the society. And it creates a mutation that gives us, my argument is, it's the beginning of modern Europe. It's the beginning of a dynamic of bottom-up activity from uh, the lower classes, initiatives, uh, uh, technology, all kinds of things. That uh, that makes the West such a different kind of culture. Uh, so that's that's the medieval work I did, and and I also work on something I call demotic religiosity, which is a religiosity that's committed to equality before the law, the dignity of manual labor. That's huge because in most pre-modern societies, the aristocrats have honor and the peasants are stigmatized. Anybody who does manual labor is stigmatized, and yet in this value system, anybody who doesn't work is considered lazy rather than, you know, somehow degraded. Um, And then the last major element of demotic religiosity is access to the religious texts. So in the Middle Ages, the attitude is, you know, well, the the populace is illiterate. Uh, Let's keep them that way. Let's give them pictures. That'll be their Bible, Uh, despite the, again, demotic prohibition on images. Uh, Iconoclasm is another characteristic. And uh, let's keep the Bible in a language they can't understand, namely Latin, even though that's a translation. Uh, whereas demotic religiosity is in favor of translating the Bible, teaching commoners how to read, that really kicks in, kicks in hard with the invention of printing, and that's why the 1500s are, are such a huge transformative period. Which most historians, if you talk to most historians, they'll say that the early modern is 16th century on. 
right? And the modern would be with the French Revolution and the American Revolution, end of the, or Industrial Revolution, end of the 18th century. But I'm saying that already in the 11th century, you have the dynamics at work that will produce this astonishing culture uh, at the risk of be calling, being called a Eurocentric historian. <laughs> I see. So um, let's dive into the subject I really wanted to talk to you about, because um, nowadays uh, you work with something called the Aldura project, right? Yes. And um, can you just explain to my listeners, because it was quite a while ago, uh, that Mohamed Aldura incident. So who was Mohamed Aldura? Okay, so Mohamed Aldura was a 12-year-old boy who, with his father, were behind a barrel um, a cement barrel in uh, a junction, Netzarim Junction, in Gaza, about the center of Gaza. And um, he was allegedly uh, shot deliberately, targeted by Israeli soldiers and shot dead in his father's arms. Um, and this was in the year the, 2000? This was right at the beginning of the Intifada. In other words, on Thursday... Um, Sharon went to the Temple Mount on Friday. Riots broke out, and Friday eve, Friday afternoon at three o'clock, this incident is filmed and sent back home, and uh, or sent to France too, where Charles Anderlin, an Israeli French journalist, uh, their major correspondent um, in the Middle East, put this together for France too with the narrative supplied by his photographer with the narrative of um uh with the narrative of the Israelis targeted him and indeed later somebody uh, an Israeli journalist said to him why did you say targeted there's no evidence that he was targeted why did you say that and he responded it was in Hebrew i don't think he thought many people would the word would get out but he responded, uh, well, what would they say in Gaza if I didn't? As if he's taking instructions from Gaza. Anyway, and it was the deliberation that was so terrible because, you know, it's one thing for somebody to be hit in a crossfire and so on. But when you have evidence that somebody deliberately targets kids, especially Israel, who's always whining about how the Palestinians deliberately target their kids, now we got the Israelis. and. The story spread like wildfire. It was just at the beginning of sort of, we, we weren't up to social media for another five years or so, but already the internet and and the spread of these things went very quickly. Um, and it electrified both the the Muslim world, the Ummah, and, and bin Laden immediately took the image and worked it into his, some people say, masterpiece, of um, global recruitment for global jihad. And at the core of it is this story with, you know, calls for vengeance and calls for overthrowing the cowardly Arab regimes and calls for attacking the horrendous Western regimes who support this and so on. Okay. So, and then in Europe and in the West, it also had an electrifying effect, really interesting, but uh, alas, among progressives, um, progressives picked up this story. And there was one French journalist who actually said, and, and has not, she's sort of regretted her words, which she felt were spoken in haste, but she hasn't really reconsidered what a folly they were. She said, this picture replaces, erases the picture of the boy from the Warsaw Ghetto. So a picture that symbolizes the deliberate hunting down and killing of 1.5 million children all of a sudden gets replaced by something, a 60 seconds of footage that doesn't even say what Charles Andelin said it said. So, so what did it say? I mean, what happened that day in, in Netzarim Crossing? So, Right. So I, I recommend everybody come to the Adua site. You can watch the original footage, most of the original footage. 
um, that I was able to see in 2003. You can see the, the, the 60 seconds broken down into, it's 70 seconds broken down into seven scenes, two of which were cut, and in particular scene six in which the boy is holding his hands over his eyes, even though allegedly he's been hit in the stomach, so one would expect him to be clutching his stomach. But no, he's got his hand over his eyes, and he lifts up his elbow, and he looks out at the camera and then slowly puts his elbow back down. And Charles Ardell, I think, understood that if he showed this, it would, nobody would buy his story. So he said, I cut it because it showed the death rose of the boy, and that was too much to bear. And he pulled it off. So in any case, what the evidence seems to indicate is that it was staged. And what happened was that no one in the West imagined that Palestinians would do this. Uh, you know, when I first worked on it, I said, look, there are five possibilities. Israelis on purpose, Israelis by accident, Palestinians on purpose, Palestinians by accident, and and people could just not even conceive that it had been staged. Um, and so that's when I made the movie Pollywood, because in looking at the raw footage from that day, two hours from Reuters, 20 minutes from uh, uh, the cameraman who filmed Adul uh, Talal Abu Rahme, they're faking stuff all the time. There's a whole industry of people who are, you know, somebody runs down the street, then, you know, like we when we played Cowboys and Indians as little kids, you know, I, I've been shot, and then they fall down, but they put their hands down to break the fall, and then a bunch of people come up and pick them up and carry them to the ambulance if they were really injured. It would be disastrous to do that. And then the ambulance speeds off uh, with its... its uh, with its um, sirens blaring. And then there are other scenes where they have them shooting into a wall or shooting into a hole in the wall, but there's nothing on the other side and stuff. And, you know, we can tell all that. So I put it together uh, with all the evidence that this kind of faking went on all the time. Um, and the name that I chose, which was Pallywood, uh, seems to have stuck. Um, and that's how I got into Pallywood. But specifically on the Adua case, this was, in every sense of the word, a, let's call it a postmodern blood libel. Uh, in other words, it was, and it was global, and it was the first one since the Holocaust to take in the West. I mean, there have been other places where, you know, Eastern Europe and obviously the Arab world where uh, blood libels uh, appeared after the year after 1945, but in the West was mostly uh, resistant to that. And this took, and it really seized the imagination, and what was so terrible was it seized the imagination of progressives, and in some sense paralyzed them from that point on in terms of their ability to deal with what we're faced with, which is, you know, it's a global war. Yeah, so Charles Enderlin, he's Jewish himself, is he not? Yeah, and he made Aliyah to Israel, and he served in the army, and he knew the guys. And when he called up and said, I got this evidence, don't try and deny it, you know, they couldn't understand that he was actually putting together some crappy piece of evidence. They didn't even ask for it. Not to uh, denigrate the, the, the suffering that goes on in Gaza now, but... I read in tablet that when you first saw the rushes, the raw footage, uh, yeah. you saw scene upon scene of Palestinians faking mm. injuries. Right. And, uh, and when right. you pointed that out, what did Charles Anderlin respond? So, right. And that's what led to the coining of the term Pallywood, because I knew from the rushes I had seen that Palestinians do these kinds of fakes. But... All the last response was, oh, yeah, they do that all the time. It's a cultural thing. That's so strange. And he had worked with, the photographer was a Palestinian called uh, Abu Rahma. Yeah, and he had worked with him for 10 years. And, and, and he, had been his, he had been taking his footage and looking for the three seconds or the one second or the five seconds that, Couldn't, it, you couldn't tell that it had been staged and stringing them those together. And this was done all over the media, CBS, uh, 
um, I start the movie with a, a special by CBS. And, and it's just that. It's just sewing together these the most plausible sight bites of these fake scenes and then talking about all the terrible casualties. And by the way, um, it's not just Charles Andelin who said, oh, you know, it's always like that. When three journalists in Paris looked at the rushes and said to Charles Andelin's boss, Didier Eppelbaum, also a Jew. that this was fake, yes, that this was all a fake, he responded, oh, oui, monsieur, mais vous savez, c'est toujours comme ça. It's always like that. To which one of them responded, you know, it may, it may be obvious to you, but it's not obvious to the public. But the story didn't go further. He stopped pushing um, alleged land words from another court Jew. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the issue basically, you know, Anderlin took Philippe Carsanti to court about this, and I, I was involved. And at one point, they, they, the court demanded that Charles show the rushes. And so he did, even though he cut them, because the most embarrassing scene, the one that led to my question, was this big fat guy who grabs his leg as if he'd been shot in the leg. And he looks around, it's only a bunch of little kids, and they're not clearly going to pick him up and carry him. I don't think anybody would, but they're not going to be. And so he looks around, and he walks away without a limp. And at that point, you know, Charles's cameraman and I both laughed, and I said, "What do you like?" He said, "Well, so much of this is fake," and all this is, "Oh yeah, they do that all the time," you know. And my mistake was, I said, "What I said was, if they do that all the time, how come you don't think they could have done it about Antua?" And he said, "Well, they're not good enough for that." But what I should have said to him is, "Why is this guy still working for you?" And after ten years, no that he's doing this stuff. And mind you, at this point in the West, it's unthinkable that people would be doing this stuff. Nobody suspected that there would be these kinds of fakes. So, so uh, but the, when you watch the video of, of the shooting, the Mohammed Aldura shooting, uh, right. it, it's, it, it looks very real. I mean, is a boy shot is or it, is a boy not shot? He's not shot. There's no blood. There's. They said there were. I think the father was supposed to have been hit by uh, eight bullets. You know, he's sitting up. If he were hit by eight bullets, there'd be blood on the wall behind him. There's no blood on the wall behind him. There's a piece of looks like red where where um, Muhammad is, is allegedly hit around his stomach. But there's also evidence that he was holding a red rag. But, you know, none of his movements, um, including as one of the um, people working on this for the government, in 2013, finally, the Israeli government decided to appoint a commission to look into it. And one of the things he pointed out is, you know, if the boy were hit, then he wouldn't be in the position he's in because you see him laid out with his head near his father's lap. Whereas before he was crouched on the same spot. So in other words, in order to be in that position, he'd have to get up and lie down in order to be in that position. But that's, you know, that's just one of the dozens of anomalies of the tape in terms of what, uh, what Charles Andelin tells us, including the fact that the bullets are not coming from the Israeli side, they're coming from the Palestinian side. They're hitting the wall head on. And the Israeli position is at a 30 degree angle. Yes. So it, that it, information comes from Nahum Shahaf, yes? Right. Uh, right. But it, it, I mean, you know, he, he, so Nahum Shahaf is a, is a um, shall we say, a curious guy. Uh, and sometimes he's hit and sometimes he's miss. And um, it was kind of frustrating looking at his evidence because he kept standing in the way of the evidence and talking and stuff. And I was like, get out of the way so we can see the bullet holes. Anyway, I mean, I, I think anybody who would reconstruct what he did in terms of what does it look like when bullets hit cement bricks um, from a 30 degree angle and from right on, and it's 
pretty clear that the holes and the dust kicked up by the holes and all that's at the site. You can see the the clips where we catch the perfectly round smoke, uh, the kick, kicked up dust from the bullet hitting the wall. And, you know, I don't think they were trying to kill him. I think they were just trying to scare him. And he sure looked scared, you know. So they wanted to make it look real. But um, and, and I don't think they killed the kid, although one guy said they did. And given how Hamas is behaving now, it's certainly not not unthinkable. But and then it was unthinkable. He was immediately uh, um, kicked off the investigation. Uh, it was very, it was, it, I mean, it, in Israel, it was a kind of third rail, electrified rail. Just don't touch it. Um, and and it was devastating, and it's been at the heart of the cognitive war campaign of the jihadis, not just Hamas war jihadis, but jihadis around the world, um, against Israel and against the West that supports it. And so you have a bunch of people now, after October 7th, literally marching in sympathy with people who behaved atrociously, um, allegedly on principles of, you know, peaceful, just, you know, all sorts of nice millenarian fantasies. And you are an expect, expert in millenarian fantasies. Yeah. Yeah. And we're dealing with two here. We're, we're dealing on the one hand with the millenarian fantasies of the global jihadis, for whom the ultimate goal is where there was Dar al-Islam, no, where there was Dar al-Kharb, the realm of the sword, the realm of war with the infidel, there shall be Dar al-Islam. In other words, there will be a global caliphate. And they see the West and its technology as uh, the expression in Hebrew is Hamorosh uh, and Mashiach, the, the Messiah's donkey. We are a vehicle to their global to their global victory. We've made it possible for Islam to fulfill its inherent destiny, which is to rule the world. So that's a, that's, that's a classic um, um, millenarian fantasy. The last person to have that fantasy um, was, uh, well, you could say either Stalin or Hitler. Uh, both of whom believed in a millenarian ideology that would reach its peak when they had conquered the entire world. So, but the other millenarian ideology is a kind of uh, 60s transformed uh, world peace, um, apocalyptic, it, it turned apocalyptic, in other words, believing that now is the moment where these things are going to happen by the apocalyptic prophecy of global warming destroying life or destroying most life on the planet. Um, and so that gets them going. But this is almost the exact opposite of the jihadis. It's all about opening to the other, you know, deconstruction. Derrida literally said deconstruction welcoming the stranger is deconstructing the self. So you make the other feel as comfortable as you in your home, which translates into, you know, these insane uh, policies of just open the borders and let everybody in and everything will be fine. So, um, so for the, for the progressive left and in particular, right after 2000, there were a whole series of, of worldwide demonstrations, either against Israel or against the United States. The biggest ones coming in 2003, when Bush wanted to uh, uh, go to war in Iraq. Um, I was in Paris at the time. It was pretty impressive. It was also very depressing because it was, you know, here are all these peace nicks who are out in the street and they've invited the what I call the caliphaters. They've invited people who are carrying flags with Saddam Hussein and Yasser Arafat, who are both people who, you know, eh, Hussein did and Arafat would, if he could, kill millions of people. So, 
you know, it, it was really, and, and there was a pacifist Israeli left-wing Hashomer HaTzayir group that was marching, and as soon as their flags were seen, the, the bully boys from the caliphaters from the banlieue uh, attacked them, and the media didn't want to cover it. And the same thing with, you know, the demonstration from Muhammad Adu a, two d- a week after it happened. It was a massive demonstration with all the left groups, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, the caliphators and the banlieue, we didn't have that word yet, and we didn't know what we were dealing with yet. Um, and, and there were people shouting death to the Jews for the first time since Literally, since the Nazis, a European capital rang out with calls of death to the Jews, and the media didn't report it. But they do report everything that comes from Hollywood. So you coined the term Hollywood, uh, which is yeah. the Palestinian Hollywood. And you say that media has been complicit in, in their productions, if you will. Yes, they, they used them. Uh, f- they used them for you. For how long? For for. Certainly before 2000, because I'm looking at, you know, what I'm looking at is already a thing. In other words, when you look at the stuff from the AP photographer, and it's up, it's available at the site. You look at the stuff from the AP photographer, uh, not the AP, the Reuters photographer, who's, who's also an Arab. It's not, you know, these aren't Western journalists who have come in to do this. And and you look at his stuff, and it's re- he, he actually had a sort of distance, and he... He allowed you to see that it was being faked, whereas Talal Abu Rahman was right in there. He actually has scenes of Talal covering what are clearly fakes when you look at his camera. You know, you see a guy with with uh, what looks like blood running easily uh, with no sign of any problem. And then all of a sudden he runs into a crowd and he comes out lying on his back, being carried by people. And there's... Talal Abu Rahman, right in there with his camera taking a picture of this fake. So, yeah, it's it, 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 basically the story was, you know, if I were a Gazan kid, you know, I would go down, I would see if I could fake a scene and get on camera and then get on the news, you know, then I'd be a celebrity. So I understand them doing it, but the journalists' resistance, you know, and – once I realized this, and once I realized, that's why I called my my blog that I started in 2005 when I came, first came out with Pallywood, I called it the Udgy and Stables, because it was clear to me that the media was so filled with bad practices that they literally encrusted everything. It wasn't like you could say to them, these guys are using fake, stop using them, because they weren't going to stop using them, and they were going to deny that they were fakes. Even though off the record, Charles Onela says to me and Didier Fulbaum says to the three journalists in Paris, oh, yeah, they do that all the time. That is quite upsetting. Um, although one of my oldest friends is a, a former war journalist who used to work in, uh, in uh, Gaza and the West Bank for, for, among others, Swedish state television. And he has told me the same thing. And then I came across uh, your articles in Tablet. Uh, Pallywood has uh, since become uh, uh, quite a sensitive word to use in the Western discourse. Yes. Yeah, there's been a massive assault. In fact, right now I'm in Paris and I'm talking with people about how to respond to a uh, an article in Le Monde on Pallywood. Now, what happened was so, sometime after the... Al-Akhli Hospital blast, which we can come back to. But just for now, that hospital that was allegedly flattened, according to the BBC, by Israel killing hundreds and hundreds of people, turned out to be a rocket shortfall that fell in the parking lot, barely made a dent, and at most maybe killed 20 people. So after that, Israelis were furious that the media didn't wait and that they immediately went out with this story. And then when the Israelis said, it's not us and it's not what you think it is, they played the he said, she said game for hours and hours. Um, So Israelis were furious and some of them started looking for more evidence of Hamas and journalistic. There's a whole crew of people and some of whom went across to do the 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 atrocities of uh, seven ten 
um, who are there to help them. And they started catching Pollywood stuff. And then there came a, a very interesting counterattack. And it started in the United States. Uh, Rolling Stone was one of the first. They all quote the same people. They will or will not mention me, but they don't interview me. Um, and they basically say, no, Pollywood, they give a whole series of examples where stuff called Pollywood turns out to have been real. They don't give any of the ones that where it turned out to have been real. They just give the ones that have. And they say Pollywood is a cog war weapon of the Israelis. I don't know if they use cog war. That's my term, cognitive warfare. But it's, it's a weapon that the Israelis are doing to prevent you from hearing the cries of help from Gaza. Now, it so happens that, you know, the task assigned to the Western media by the Palestinian leadership, which is, does not hesitate to use violence when it uh, feels it needs to, um, is that they are to report Palestinian suffering. That's their task. And, and the strategy of Hamas is we build the tunnels, not for people to hide in, but for us to move our bombs around. Um, we fire at the Israelis, and when they fire back, they kill our people, and that's a huge... and. Sorry, they kill our people, and the media obsesses over the dead Palestinians. And that's a huge, first of all, it's a huge degradation of Israel. I mean, today it's common for people to say Israel's committing genocide. Yes. So, and they're even going up um, to before a, court, a, a world court uh, on this matter. Um, and, and so, on the one hand, you have um, this. But but without the coverage, if if the Western media were to focus, for instance, on uh, people in Gaza who are furious with Hamas and denounce them, and we have a number of cases where they start to speak to Al Jazeera reporters, and the Al Jazeera reporters cut them, you know, stop them, cut them off, because that's not what you're supposed to hear. But if the journalists were to do stuff like that, instead of doing this, you know, pieta of mothers with their dead children in their arms, um, that strategy of sacrificing their own people wouldn't work. But it does work, and it works because the media's job is Palestinian suffering. And they feel perfectly justified because it's for peace. If we push hard enough with how terrible the Israelis are, they will be forced to stop by the international community and there will be a ceasefire, which they then identify with peace rather than with the next round coming and worse. Yes. Can you explain the Islamic mass media charter? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things about modern journalism, And it's a core element of the basic principles of a democracy. I mean, the, the French Revolution and the American Revolution are clear at the start. The press needs to be free. They're clear that you can't have a democracy unless there's a free press to inform people reliably and not as sort of ideological or political. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't that journalism, but... A good professional journalist would not become an ideologue and pre present propaganda as news just because the ideology called for it. Unfortunately, that's now happened, but that's it's another story. But the, 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 the issue here is that um, the press began to move in a postmodern period towards narratives. Um, and one of the decisions that the press made in the Middle East was, you know, we've told the narrative of the Israeli David against the Arab Goliath. Let's tell the story of the Israeli Goliath and the Palestinian David. And so right now you can tell right away when, well, at this point, everybody uses it. But the use of Palestinian Israeli conflict when Hezbollah, <laughs> is there and Iran is there and you know this is this is a Muslim problem that's not all Muslims hopefully hopefully but it is what I call triumphalist Muslims so to get back to the to the um, Islamic media to charter. The, yeah the immediate charter 
So in a modern media charter, it would be, I'm not going to fall into, I'm not going to be a propagandist. I'm going to tell the story as I really think it happened and not uh, bow down, bow to um, uh, the dictates of the powerful. Uh, in the Islamic charter, it's, it, you know, so it, the, the modern principle of justice is whoever's right, my side or not, right? You, sometimes you're wrong and you admit you're wrong, um, at least in principle. It's hard to admit you're wrong, but okay. Uh, so, but the, the, the Muslim charter and the Arab charter, because there are two, and they're both basically the same in this sense is, you know, a good Arab journalist will not shame his people. He will not report things that make his people look bad. So essentially, it's the pre-modern notion, tribal notion of my side right or wrong. Whatever happens, I got to support my side. And, you know, so you get these journalists who enter the mainstream through all these DEI projects in the West of, you know, we have to open to marginalized voices. And what they're doing is they're letting in people who are coming to carry on a cognitive war with Israel aimed at destroying it. And they can't see that because they're too proud of how they've diversified their... Um, they're journalists. So their virtue gets in the way of the seeing reality as it is, or their virtue signaling, well, rather. Yes, yes, virtue signaling. So uh, so let me ask this, because you're up in Scandinavia, and, and uh, you know, I've, there, I quote some books by Scandinavian authors. Um, I forget her name, but uh, she wrote a book on honor killings in Sweden. In any case, um, you know, one of the things that struck me in the early years of the 20th century when I first figured out this stuff um, was that, you know, above all, mostly it was Sweden, but you had the sense that the Scandinavians believed that they were sort of the, the, the global beacon of the good life and how, how to do it. And they were sort of at the cutting edge of the progressive West. Um, and my sense was that some of the thrill of the new lethal journalism where reporters are basically <clears throat> telling the war propaganda of their enemies, certainly Israel's enemies, but also their enemies, um, that in, in dealing with this, they couldn't admit that this was going on, because if they did, then they'd be racists for describing another culture as radically different from ours. I certainly got called a racist all the time, and I, I would say it's about culture; it's not about race. And they would, and and they would say, I don't care, because at the time, being called a racist was, you know, what being called a genocider is now. It's it's the worst of the worst. So I don't care if it's accurate. Well, uh, I get called a Nazi a lot. So, uh, yeah, Sweden is a very special case. I actually wrote a book about the relationship to the Second World War because, you know, the, the Swedish myth is the myth of neutrality, that we were new, neutral right, right. during the uh, Second World War. And right. uh, when I released it, uh, police stormed uh, my publisher and confiscated all the books. And then I was uh, prosecuted for two and a half years. Uh, so uh, I think um, my home country, uh, which I'm generally sort of 50-50 uh, proud of, right. um, they have a very complicated uh, relationship uh, to uh, that part of their history. And I think, yeah. uh, because I don't know if you know this, but uh, Sweden was actually uh, the first country in the Western world uh, to... Um, well, our prime minister in his official capacity was the first Western prime minister to meet Arafat. They met in Algeria in 1974, the day before his famous speech at the UN, you know, the yeah. olive branch in one yeah. hand and pistol on the hip. Right, right, right. Um, so uh, they gave them a huge propaganda victory. And Olof Palme, who was a prime minister we had, uh, oh, yeah. got murdered. Uh, yes. uh, he was uh, together with the Austrian uh, Bruno Kreisky and uh, 
and the West German uh, uh, Chancellor at the time, right. uh, they were called the Three Musketeers because uh, they had this idea that they were uh, supposed to be in between uh, the the, the contrasts of, of the Cold War. They were not Soviet communists. They were not American capitalists. Right. They were social democrats. And uh, so right. they had this, they, they uh, aligned with the so-called non-aligned movement in the U.S. Third world. Uh, and right. Um, right. yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a complicated history when it comes to Sweden and anti-Semitism. Right. And, and you mentioned the uh, Ali Arab hospital in- incident. Uh, right. Uh, right. Um, and uh, already the 19th of October, I mean, the, the attack against, or the, the misfire of the, Palestinian Islamic Jihad occurred late at night, the 18th of October, and already in the morning of the 19th, we had people marching through the streets of Stockholm, calling yeah, yeah. for, uh, you know, uh, the dismantling of the, the Israeli state. And uh, that is quite normal uh, where I come from. Right. And can you, can you imagine if the story had spread through the Muslim world that the Israelis hit the hospital, and all the Western press did what they should do, which is not say anything until they have enough evidence to say something. And instead of running, Israeli strike hits hospital, kills 500, Palestinians say, waiting for several hours and saying, we don't know what's going on, but we're not going to report on it until we have a better sense. Um, and the Western press had all come out with pictures of the tiny uh, crater in the parking lot. Can you imagine the difference, certainly in terms of the people supporting Hamas in the West, you know, who are, who are on their heels now after 710 and sympathy for Israel? And people were starting to rethink, well, wait a minute. I mean, in Israel, there's this expression, the conceptia. And the conceptia, which we no longer hold by, was if we're nice to them, they'll be nice to us. It doesn't work. Well, sir, the so, first thing that would happen if the Western media started reporting the actual truth is that I'd be out right. of a job. <laughs> no, no, no. They'd hire you. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> you'd, you'd go to much higher levels because you'd reach a public. I mean, they're basically preventing people in the public from hearing the voices they need to hear. Yes, but let's return to the Al Ali Arab Hospital incident because okay. what happened was quite interesting. Because in the beginning, since seven ten, Israel actually, for the first time in my life, uh, being a, a Swedish Jew, uh, Israel actually got some sympathy. It has never happened before, yes. and all our party leaders across the political it's spectrum. It's in, uh, con- con- yeah, con- now, hold on. In 19. 19- in 1991, when Israel was getting hit from Iraq with scuds and Palestinian Arabs were climbing on their roofs in Jerusalem to cheer the scuds, um, Israel got world sympathy because we didn't fight back. But it's only when we're attacked, it's only when we suffer, and it's only when we don't hit back that we have people's approval. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, this was the first time in, that I can remember that all party leaders in Sweden across the political spectrum actually condemned Hamas. I don't... Interesting. interesting. So, and, and that happened uh, pretty much the day after because we had a big uh, 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 election debate on Swedish state television. And, and, and then, uh-huh. you know, two weeks pass and, and, and then the Al uh, Ali Arab hospital... Uh, gets uh, bombed, and and it and it right. and it turns 180 degrees in less than 24 yeah. hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the behavior of the media in that case is probably it's probably the worst since they bought the Janine massacre in 2002. I mean, this is so clearly. A false story. And in all its details, it was not Israeli. It was not, it did not hit the hospital and it didn't get ill anywhere near 500 people or even 200 or even, as I said, probably a dozen, two dozen. So, you know, and, and it's the jihadis who did it. And, um, but 
when Hamas came out, and mind you, as you, you said yourself, this is 10 days later, Israel has the sympathy of the world, and Hamas tells this whopper of a lie, which, you know, I mean, they know that the next morning people are going to see what, the, what it was and realize that it's not what they said, but for them, it's priceless to have those 12 hours overnight from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in which they can get the Western media to tell their story. You know, and it's like, I was thinking, holy mackerel, you guys, they'll slaughter Jews in the most despicable way, but you don't think they'll lie to you? Yeah, it's uh, quite astonishing, actually. Yeah. So um, what now? Uh, you live in Israel. Uh, you, you teach at bar Ilan University. No, I don't teach. I retired from teaching. I was I was part of a, a center. I was a fellow at a center there. All right. And uh, what's the stimmung like in Israel now? Are you? Uh, are, is well, look. You know, uh, it, it uh, look the. It's clear to the vast number of people that this is an existential war. I mean, I have a. There was a reviewer of my book who finally got his review accepted, and he titled it a year after the book came out, the book that saw 710 coming a mile away. You know, and I'm getting notes from people saying, you know, I listened to you and I really thought you exaggerated, but you were right. My daughter's Sayer, Cassandra, and so on. So um, there's a widespread acknowledgement uh, that this is, it's a global effort. It's a very serious effort. These people are not going to be bought off by our being nice to them. Um, and in fact, I mean, one of the things I argue in my book is that for the positive sum Westerners, including the Israelis, um, land for peace was a positive sum solution. Israel gives something, they get something. The Palestinians get something, they give something. Everybody wins. No. It's a zero-sum game. Whatever they get, they will use for war. So instead of the, the Western formula for Oslo was land for peace, the Palestinian Arab triumphalist Muslim version of Oslo was land for war, which is what he said, uh, Arafat said in an address that he thought was um, private to Muslims in South Africa, the the year after he had made his Peace of the Brave speech uh, for the Nobel Prize. So um, he, this, the, um, I don't, am I answering a question of yours or have I got No, no, off? no. I think you are answering a question uh, because I'm, I'm asking about, because when I went to Israel last time, and I've been a few. Oh, yes, the mood. Yeah. The mood, right. So there's, yeah, there's, there's, you know, we were being torn apart by these demonstrations for and against, but mostly against um, the legal reform. Um, I mean, both Israel and the United States have democracies that are very seriously challenged. So do the Europeans. Everybody does under the current conditions. We can go back to that. But, but after the attack, everybody understood. So there's a huge amount of volunteering going on. There's a huge, um, you know, gibush. There's a, a coming together. Um, now, how long that can last uh, is another matter. But certainly in terms of the army, the only thing that you hear is we understand what we have to do. And we have to get it Hamas. And does it look as if though Israel is winning? That war at the moment? Um, I try as a medievalist to stay away from, I mean, I watch football, but I, 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 don't, um, I don't trust the information that comes out enough, even from the government. Obviously, the government has every interest in saying everything's going fine, and I want to believe that. But, you know, um, I, I, I honestly don't know, and I wouldn't, to, you know, on a podcast, I wouldn't uh, uh, give my opinion. That's uh, quite worrying. Uh, but uh, let's go back. You say that Israeli democracy, American democracy, and European democracy is being challenged at the moment. 
Where do do, do those right. challenges come from? You think? Well, the main challenge. I mean, there are there are lots of challenges. There's the Russians, the, the Chinese, uh, but um, the one that I focus on, uh, partly because, as far as I know, it's specifically millennial, is the uh, triumphalist Muslim effort at what I call the global caliphate. And they've put huge pressure on the West um, to downplay the violence of uh, Muslims in the West. So there's been a great deal of aggression, um, which either doesn't get reported or when it can't be avoided because it's really outrageous, like torturing an old lady and throwing her body over the balcony, it gets attributed to uh, mental illness. Um, so uh, this was an instance in I mean, France just, that happened. A, a yes, Jewish old yes, woman means, got murdered. Right. That's right. And so what, what you have with these situations is um, the Muslims, particularly in Europe and particularly in France and England and Germany, um, you know, they have moved in. They have a street um, which starts with Muhammad Adua and which uh, goes off on its own at various moments. Um, in particular, I think this one. Um, so you have a great deal of aggression that's gone unreported. And what you have, uh, you know, I know the French press, but not as well, so I won't go there. Let me just say that in, the American, in America today, there is probably half the population that has come to the same conclusion that I came to back in 2003, which is you cannot trust what the media is telling you. They have an agenda and they carry out that agenda. And you can see that agenda in things like, you know, the George Floyd riots are mostly peaceful, right? I mean, if it were Republicans or, or you know, white nationalists who were rioting, this would be as it is with the Capitol, it's an insurrection, you know. And in fact, the same, the same station that wouldn't use the word terrorist for Hamas had no trouble putting on an FBI guy who said that the, it was t January 6th at the Capitol was terrorism. So, you know, we're not dealing with straight shooters. And you can see that in the al Ahly Hospital thing because, you know, they think they're straight shooters. I mean, they are convinced that they are doing a good job. So in the case of CNN, you have um, uh, Peter Lerner, and this is at noon. So this is like six hours after the evidence has been made available. There are estimates that are serious out there that anybody can access. And, and six hours later, Peter Lerner is trying to explain the evidence and she keeps saying, well, but what about this? And what, well, but what about that? And he finally says, look, you know, you, you, he doesn't say he should have said, because it's evident from her questions. You haven't looked at the evidence. You're just sitting there playing two narratives. This he did say you're, you're, you're playing the narratives. You know, he didn't say he said, she said, but that's the short term for it. You know, you, you tell a story. He said this, she said that, and who knows? And they kept throwing up their hands and saying, who knows when the evidence was overwhelming. The, the empirical evidence was overwhelming that the Israelis were right. And yet, they wouldn't. And so Peter says, I don't think you're interested in what actually happened. And she cuts him off. This is Becky Anderson. Cuts him off and says, I'm sorry, I can't allow you to say that. No, Peter Lerner, we are looking for the truth. You know, just as she is doing the exact opposite. It, it's, a, it's a rather shocking moment. Yeah, it's uh, because I remember reading in your uh, article in Tablet that uh, Anderson Cooper uh, first say, says, we cannot independently confirm how many people were killed in this blast, but the pictures are sickening. Right. Yes, and, yes. <laughs> and the pictures are <laughs> No, because there are no pictures. The, the, the photographer's quote is, there were so many bodies I couldn't even photograph. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, and we're supposed to believe that he's so deeply moved that he can't take a picture of it. Nobody there can take a picture of hundreds of bodies. 
And the most we get is two pictures of 20 corpses, and they could be the same corpses, you know, in two different places. And it's just, you know, and, and it's in the hospital parking lot, um, and there are a whole bunch of people standing around. So the bodies that you're looking at are what they've got. This is not, uh, you know, this isn't, the place isn't littered with bodies. So, you know, they got no good evidence. They, you know, they should have immediately, even without asking the Israelis, they should have had a photographer on the scene who could take a flash shot of the crater. Yeah. You know, the people, the journalists on the scene, they could have taken a picture of that crater and sent it back to them. And that's what should have happened. And and they would have known even before the Israelis started defending themselves that it wasn't Israel. And yet the attachment to the story of Israel killing Palestinian people in a hospital who have come there for refuge from war, torn, a safe place, how could they do that, was just too attractive. Yeah. And uh, once the lie was out, people started believing it, was, it. And then it was, uh, then you guys were pretty much fucked. Yes, yes, yes. But so were everybody in the West who is being duped by a movement that will behave atrociously if they gain power into giving them power. Yeah. It's astonishing. Because, you know, one of the big complaints, and I, I think it's a supersessionist complaint, Uh, which apparently you don't have to believe in God to be supersessionist. Um, the complaint that, oh, the Jews, you know, 2,000 years, they were treated so badly, but no sooner do they get power than they turn around and act like they're persecutors. Okay, that's a, that's a beloved uh, uh, truth. Yes. So, so look at the Palestinians and ask yourself, How long will it take them? It's taken us, according to you, 75 years to get to the point of committing genocide. How long do you think it's going to take the Palestinians to use whatever power you give them to do evil things? I mean, you know, on the one hand, you're, you're, you're complaining about our lack of moral upstandedness, but you're completely ignor ignoring the people who are your real enemies and you're supporting them. I don't know. I, why, why would Europe side with the Palestinians when the Palestinians side with people who want to conquer Europe? I've tried to figure that out for, for quite some time, uh, actually. Um, not sure. think it might have something to do with Christianity and turning the other cheek or something. Uh, also socialism. Yeah. So, okay, let's leave socialism aside. Let's take turning the other cheek because it's really interesting. Here you have a precept that's probably as close to Jesus as we can get. It's, you know, it's very likely something that he taught. Uh, in my analysis, he taught it as an apocalyptic command. In other words, here in the, at the very end of time, you know, just before judgment day, don't turn to violence, uh, turn the other cheek. But as Paul says, you know, on judgment day, that'll be taken care of. Okay. So, but in the entire history of Christian nations, starting with Constantine, um, we never have a Christian nation that invokes turn the other cheek as a principle for international relations, right? Yeah. Can you think of any? No. no. Okay. So, and now in postmodern Europe, they're actually imposing it on us. The postmoderns, the postcolonials are imposing turn the other cheek onto us as a principle of foreign politics. It's quite strange. I, I've... Uh... Uh, compared the the coverage of the war in Ukraine in Europe with the, the coverage of the Israeli Hamas war, and, and right. in in the Ukraine uh, case, uh, the media is has a consensus: the war must go on until the end. You know, right? Uh, but in the Israeli case, the war must stop as soon as possible. And they're both connected because they're both the front line of the West. Right, right. So that's fascinating because it, you know, one of the things I was thinking about the Ukrainians is 
when they see how how the media covers this and the sort of huge that the, you know the NBC has a special section just for what they call coverage, but what should be called Palestinian suffering, you know, and and the Ukrainians are looking at this and must be thinking we we got the wrong enemy. We needed the Jews as our enemy yeah. because having the Russians as our enemy doesn't get much for us. But, oh, look at what these people get for having the Jews as their enemy. And, you know, the, the there's famous uh, Palestinian poet uh, Mahmoud Darwish who was interviewed in the late 60s by an Israeli avant-garde journalist. And he said to her in confidence, um, you know, the only reason that people like our cause is because we're fighting you. If we were fighting anybody else, nobody would give. He didn't say a flying, you know what, but yeah. So, um, so yeah. So the obsession of the West with the Jews is something to behold. It's really, you know, as a historian who studies history over a thousand, really 2000, 3000 years of trajectory, um, but my focus is the last thousand years. Um, as a historian who looks at big things, this is, you know, this is really a kind of astonishing piece of behavior. There's a very interesting book um, called, what's the term he uses? Um, it's like unintended evidence. It's evidence that you give by your behavior without realizing that you are indicating a preference. And here we have the media indicating a literal obsession with Israel. And so in 107, I'm sorry, in 1710, in on the 17th of October, Al Ahli Hospital, um, CNN, it was four o'clock in the United States. Was it four? No, it was even Three. earlier. It was like, yeah. So um, in the States, they dropped everything to cover this. I mean, the next person who spoke was a woman who had a, a news, a, a business news program. And she just dropped everything because all 52 minutes, when not advertisements, all 52 minutes that she had were dedicated to covering the al Ahly hospital strike and describing how terrible conditions were for the poor Palestinians. And that went on. And, and even now, the, the coverage that CNN is giving, or the BBC less, France 24 less, but nonetheless, huge chunks of media attention to what the Jews do. It's really it's enough to make you a believer. Um, yes, so, uh, the, 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 the awesome power of anti-Semitism, it's uh, truly astonishing to see. Yeah. You no, know, uh, in Sweden we have had huge demonstrations where they shout, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, it bari uh, we haven't heard Chaybar because that has been reported on, so they stopped singing that. Um, uh -huh. But there's nothing about this on the news, nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, but when the speakers at this demonstration start talking about a conspiracy where they allege that the Swedish government is stealing Muslim children to raise them as Christians, that's when the news start reporting uh, on it. Um, and uh, we had in our state television, uh, our big news show, uh, uh, the, the, the show host asks one of our ministers of civil defense, about this conspiracy theory, and he interrupts her, and he says, well, uh, that is uh, atrocious and important to talk about, but what I think we should really talk about is the anti-Semitism that we see in these de demonstrations. And she has no yeah. follow-up questions. She just goes right back yeah. to the conspiracy theory against the social services. It's, and it's yeah, quite so that's telling. A, that's a, yeah, and that's a good example of the kind of Augean stable journalism that the West is getting. They're getting a single message and anything that would make them think differently. I mean, I'm convinced that the reason why the media thought that it was covering the Al-Aqsa Intifada, I call it the Oslo Jihad, um, were covering that suicide bombing, the first suicide terror campaign against a Western democracy. 
Um, and it was a campaign, and they covered it, and they really believed that by emphasizing the suffering of the Palestinians and bringing to an end the violence, they were going to make the world a better place. Um, and that that there's no awareness of how they're, they don't seem to be aware of how they're being manipulated. And it's, so this example that you just gave is, is a perfect example of how, you know, I don't want you to know what's actually going on because you might come to a different conclusion from the one I think you should come to. Um, and, it, and it's a disaster. So in your case, it's interesting because on the one hand, you have no coverage of the demonstrations. No. Right? But you do have coverage of what incites the demonstrations namely Palestinian yes. suffering on the news. And that's exactly what was happening in France in 2000. They were, the, the Antifada was pumped into everybody's uh, living room with images of suffering. Mohammed Adul was the lead image. Every day, it was every day when the news came, we're going to see what's happening in Palestine. There's Mohammed Adul. Right? And it's the same thing with Al Jazeera TV. So, you know, on the one hand, you have this, this, this media that is making things thousands and thousands of times worse. They're, they're basically behaving like, you know, people throwing matches in ammunition dumps. And then when it leads to riots in the West, in their own hometowns, they don't cover it. Oh, it's amazing. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time, Professor. Can I ask you, is it possible to see your film Pollywood anywhere? Sure, sure. It's at my Vimeo site. If you type Pollywood, I'll send you the link. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll send you a digital copy yep. of my book in English so you can see for yourself. Excellent. And, Excellent um, conversation. And, and thank you for participating in Deconstructive Criticism. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism. This episode's guest was Professor Richard Landers. You can find him on Twitter, and I again urge you to watch his short documentary, Pallywood, on Vimeo. It's only 20 minutes. You can find the link in the description of this episode on aaronflam.com. Thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism. A special thanks to you who are a patron of Deconstructive Criticism. If you want to contribute to my work, you can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash Aaron Flam, patreon.com slash Aaron Flam in one word, or donate via PayPal with Bitcoin or on Swish 0046 768 Please help spread Deconstructive Criticism. All contributions matter, and I consider you a hero if you do. I am Aaron Flam. Until next, have a